Baltic Sea Adventure. Previously on Baltic Sea Adventure, Yari tells his friend Kimo about the German U-boat lost at the Baltic Sea. There aren't that many divers of the thought that could do a talk with this guy, leave this up here in the UK, and he gave me some pointers. Are you guys like up to this type of Baltic Sea adventure? It sounds uh, very exciting. Never dived a U-boat before. Yeah. Sounds great. Kimo and Tanya start filming, and a small documentary balloons into a big adventure. We find an expert diving team in Stockholm. Don't splash. Don't splash. Boss's an early attempt to have two full gun decks. In the we visit the magnificent Vasa wreck. Much before Vasa. We see the sights of Stockholm and start receiving diving footage from the Swedish divers. It's actually right now trying to find out if there are any relatives left for... It's a pretty cool story. The hunt for U-479 continues. While Kimo and Tanya are still in Sweden, our friend Yari Lintukankali is exploring the Estonian capital, Tallinn. This town has strong ties with the Scandinavian neighbours. It was an important seaside link between Russia and Nordic countries. After just visiting Stockholm, it's amazing how the old town of Tallinn reminds you of the old town in Stockholm. This is not accidental. Just like in Stockholm, there's been a settlement here for thousands of years and a stronghold since early Middle Ages. And just like Stockholm, Tallinn was once a Hans town. It used to be under Danish rule on and off for hundreds of years. Even the name Tallinn means Danish town in Estonian. Tallinn has been sold to Germans, ruled by the Swedes in the 15 and 1700s, has been invaded by the Germans and the communist Soviet Union. It's a small miracle that Tallinn has held on to one of the most preserved medieval old towns in the world. The Russian Orthodox Church is situated right beside the Estonian Parliament House. There is the 16th century bastion, Fat Margaret, that used to protect the old entrance to the walled town. The Estonian Maritime Museum is situated just under the bastion inside the town walls. Yari's not just here to do some sightseeing. He will meet the staff of the Maritime Museum and investigate the collision between submarine Lembit and the German U-479. Maybe they'll be able to help us find the lost U-boat. A German U-boat U-479 got lost at the Baltic Sea at the end of the Second World War. On the 15th of November 1944, on its 19th day at sea, U-boat U-479 gave its last radio report in the Finnish archipelago. After that, the boat and its 51 crew hasn't been seen or heard of. It's a reported fact that the Russian submarine Lembit hit an unidentified object. Was it the U-479 that sunk into the depths of the Baltic Sea? Lembit is slightly damaged and after surfacing reports that it has seen oil and German debris floating on the sea surface. 
Could it have collided with the German U-boat, U-479? Over 60 years later, we search for the truth. Meanwhile, Tanya and Kimo are in Stockholm. Tor, Par and Charlotta have agreed to help us in the hunt for U-479. They are experienced technical divers and underwater cameramen. Technical diving means advanced diving techniques in deep waters and diving with Trimax gases. We visit Tor's diving shop, Oceanic Tech, and Tor tells us more. Say, when I'm in the good position and look handsome. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> A little bit out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> of the picture. If you are using the normal system, then and you're diving for a long time, does it have any kind of side effects? If you should do a 40 meters dive with air, you get drunk, mm -hmm. and the decision you make when you're drunk is probably not the yeah. best decision yeah. ever made. Yeah. In normal diving, the air tank contains 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen and tiny amounts of other gases and water. The quantity of oxygen in air becomes dangerous when diving in depths below 30 meters. Oxygen becomes toxic in the increased pressure. But it's perfectly fine to use normal air when diving in shallow waters. Nitrox is enriched air. Aha, uh -huh. oh. okay, yeah. yeah. Because I was thinking it's some kind of new gas or... So no, no. How yeah. much does it give you more time then? Uh, at 30 meters, uh, it's around 30% uh, longer time before you come into the de decompression. And then we're back with all the bottles and things like that. Yeah. It's quicker to decompress on this gas than on the trimix. Because of the O2. Yeah, like, because like of with the trimix. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. You have helium, oxygen, and air. Try three. Yeah. Three different gases that yeah. you're mixing into one gas. Trimix is a mix of three components, oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. The amount of oxygen is reduced to avoid the toxicity problems. Nitrogen is reduced to avoid the narcotic effect on depths greater than 30 meters. And the rest is made up of helium, a light gas to stop the air getting thick. In deep sea diving, Trimix is used. Trimix keeps your head clear. But when coming back to the surface, using just Trimix would take too long. At certain stages of the ascent, the gas breathed is changed by using alternative bottles. At 21 meters, the gas is changed to include 50% oxygen. At six meters, the bottle is changed again to 100% oxygen. So in theory, you could dive without those small bottles. Yeah. And use that and, and just like you know, make the time right. Yeah. It will. It will. Be, the only difference is it will much much longer time. Yes. So if you are diving like this, I will be home sleeping when you still are in the water. Yeah. But remember, this is advanced diving. This is not normal sports diving. Everyone shouldn't be diving at 60, 70 meters. Mm. Because it's very, very advanced diving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You... And it needs a lot, lots of skills to do that. Yeah. Well, this is for like sports diving, first gear down to perhaps 30 meters and with the air and night drugs. Yeah. And if you buy this for what do you say, like 1000 euros, and you want to do some more advanced diving afterwards, mm. after a couple of years when you're diving, you would probably want to dive in double tanks like this. Yeah. Because it's more air. And you have two separate first, two separate first stages uh, to have redundancy. If, if one broke, you can actually turn the valve off and just use the other one, and still have access to all the air in the tanks. So it's expandable in a way. Yeah. So mm. if you use, if you buy it, you can actually use this back plate that fits yourself perfectly. You can use this regulator and just buy another one here. Yeah. And a bigger wing. So it's kind of upgradable for yeah. people. Who and so the air and the nitro system is just like the same, it's just the gas in this Yeah, it's the yeah. different gas. Yeah. This is the exact setup we are using when we're diving. Yeah. yeah. Trimix. If you're diving like we are doing in Sweden, you need definitely a dry suit. And it's like on the James Bond movie, you can actually have a tuxedo on the inside and you will stay totally, totally dry. Yeah. 
thin and flexible and you can get it uh, measured on to, to fit yourself perfectly. Yeah. So you look good too. <laughs> yeah, to the face. Yeah. On the fish. No, on the, boat, on the boat before and after the dive it's quite important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect fit. Yeah. It's a perfect fit. Yeah. How much gas you have left? How many gas that you are dead? Yeah, yeah if you like, like, like this one, you're pretty close to death. <laughs> so what you do is to give each other okay or uh, something is wrong, signal, distress, yeah. something is wrong, something is wrong. So light is our primary communication device. Yeah, and the water. And also if you want to see it. Yeah, yeah. So normally when diving you just swing around, swing, swing around. You're assuming like this, yeah, swimming, looking watching. at things, and once in a while you're just doing okay signs for, for your buddies and then swing around. So everybody fill their own tank, so most of the time I end up doing this tank. Tour, Per and Lotta show us how the Trimix gases are mixed and the bottles filled. Unlike in the traditional diving with air tanks, the technical divers need different mixes for different depths. It can catch fire, like in the valves and in the tanks, so that would be a pretty bad experience, I think. Yeah. 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 Swedish pan pipe. <laughs> this, this is more fun than filling tanks outside. It's helpful to us to see the huge amount of gear they need. Let's check the leak. The team is preparing for a diving trip to Narvik, Norway. There they will dive a few wrecks, including a Second World War Nazi German U boat, U 711, and its supply ship, Black Watch. It takes a lot of preparations to go diving with this team. <laughs> uh, it's like a kinky version. Yeah, that's exactly. not quite good. It's put here in tourist, in tourist bag, I think. Oh, yeah. While the diving team travels to Norway, Tanya and Kimo join Yari in Tallinn, Estonia. Yari is on his way back from the meeting with the Maritime Museum. For all the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, the latest and successful bid for freedom and independence only happened in 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet rule. The change was peaceful and was called the Singing Revolution because of the spontaneous rallying of ordinary people. In Estonia, about 300,000 people, one third of the population, attended one singing gathering in Tallinn. In the hotel, Kimo, Yari and Tanya catch up on the project progress. While the trip to Sweden was a success, Yari has his doubts about the possible cooperation from the Estonian Maritime Museum. They seemed uncertain about giving us information, or helping us find the U-boat wreck, or renting us their research ship, Mari. We later found out that the Estonians had already agreed to help an American filming crew at the Baltic Sea the same summer. 
Maybe this affected their willingness to cooperate. And here's the famous Lembit and research ship Mare. Lembit was going through renovation before its return to its current use as a museum ship. During the Soviet rule, private citizens were not allowed to dive the local wrecks. One exception to this rule was a legendary Estonian diver and wreck hunter, Bela Mas, seen here with the submarine Lembit in the summertime. In the past 15 years, these Baltic countries have moved on by leaps and bounds, opened up to the west and joined European Union. Soviet high-rises still dominate the suburbs, while the new city skyscrapers are being built near the medieval town centre. Despite the chequered past, their national identities are strong and the economic growth has been phenomenal. We are constantly telling everybody to visit now when you can still see the changes taking place. Still, there's old with the new. Everywhere by the Baltic seashore, there are touching memorials for sunken ships and the men who never returned from a voyage. In Tallinn, there's the statue for Rizalka, a monitor-type Russian warship that disappeared with 177 crew in 1893. Velomas and his Estonian crew and a group of Finnish divers found the wreck only recently. Finnish Jussi Karsinen was one of the first divers to dive Rusolka. It sunk in a storm like a stone and stands in the clay seabed in an upright position. Today it's covered with fishermen's nets and is a challenging dive. USS Monitor was the first monitor type ship. Big idea was here that there was very shallow deck and all the vulnerable parts were underwater line and uh, this big armored cannon tower would be on top of water and the... Or a turret, yeah. Yeah, a turret actually. And the problem was of course that the there's awful lot of mass, very high. It's very difficult to maneuver and steer in a heavy season. It was very unstable, extremely unstable. And also USS Monitor had the same end as Rusatka, USS Monitor sank in a storm in last day of December 1862. The big problem with in a storm was that it started leaking. And, and as there was no freeboard, even, even a moderate leakage would, would cause it to sink more and just go down like a, like a, a submarine, yeah. with the exception that the submarine you can blow you can you can blow the tanks and come up again. Yeah, and one thing to remember is that these things were powered by steam engine. If you're yeah. burning coal in order to get steam, you need a bunch of air. You cannot keep all openings completely tight. So what do we have here is a picture of Rusaga's back deck and this is especially interesting pictures, picture because this is the area which is visible in the wreck today. Searching for a shipwreck like this, you browse through a bunch of, bunch of archive material and translate Russian text as I don't speak Russian for example and luckily my colleague Vladimir Ermolov at work was willing to help and he was translating some material in the evenings. What it takes to find a shipwreck is awful lot of coffee and duct tape to close everyone's mouth so that no one can ask them, okay, when do we find it? And of course you do a bunch of analysis on what, what could have happened, make some kind of hypothesis and uh, make time plots and where everyone was heading and traveling 
at what time. It's rather nice because Tutsa survive. There are very good logs on weather conditions and location and so on. July 22nd, it was Tuesday evening, uh, Estonian Maritime Museum, their vessel Mare with Captain Bellomes, they were able to locate a very promising target and we were out there also doing some own work and called Bello and asking how are things proceeding. It seems that you are in the very same spot and have been there for quite some time. And Bello said that we have a very promising target here, uh, but they were lacking divers and equipment for checking that one. And I said that we do have equipment on board. We did one dive, dive at the wreck site. We hit the bottom at a depth of 74, 75 meters. Turned out there are a bunch of debris from the ship but we did not uh, see the main hull of the ship. On Thursday, uh, July 24th, uh, Bello and his crew was at the wreck site and we both dived at the site and it turned out that yes, this indeed is the hull of Rusalka. There's awful lot of clay apparently in the bottom because half of the ship, about 30 meters of the ship, is inside clay and the uh, hull itself is standing upright and the propellers are coming to about 40 meters and the as said bottom is 74, 75 meters deep. Uh, Swedes have always been a magnificent engineer when they are building ships. Mr. Eriksson was the one who designed the monitor type ships and they were known to be very poor in balance and they were tipping over rather easily. And well, then again we have to remember that Mr. Eriksson actually did also invent the propeller. Yeah, yeah, the that's, true, as we yeah know that, that's true. So that's it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's perhaps one of the most remarkable uh, inventions in, 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 uh, in naval architecture. And so uh, it was quite an early invention though. Yeah, yeah it was actually. Uh, this, and the torque this of the propeller uh, affects the, uh, the, the turning rate ratio of the ship. Yeah. So, the mystery of the vanished ship Rizolka is solved at last. It's said that the memorial happens to point directly to the wreck's site. Before leaving Tallinn, we visit the Tallinn harbour Perita, where the submarine Lembit usually is moored. No sight of Lembit, no sight of summer, no research boat. We seem to have hit a brick wall. Feeling a bit sorry for ourselves, it's time to say goodbye to Tallinn for now and take a ferry to Helsinki. Far away from Estonia, our diving team and their friends are doing well in Narvik. Per and Lotte tell us via webcam how the dive on the Second World War German U-boat U711 went. This boat is very much like the U479 we are looking for. They also tell about the supply ship Black Watch. The divers, they, their biggest dream is actually to dive a U-boat. It's kind of hard to understand if you watch the film. It's like a tube. It's nothing. <laughs> the cool thing with it is like, it's a teak deck uh, and the, the, the deck was still in place. Yeah. And you can see the propeller, you can see the tower and some stuff, and that's about it. Yeah. In this little harbour north of Narvik, the Germans had this service ship, or what is it it's called? What's yeah, it called? supply ship. Supply ship, good. Uh, where the, the seamen could, they could have a rest, they could like watch a move, they could have like good food. And the story is they probably even can get, get themselves a woman or something on that ship. Mm -hmm. But that's the story about the Black Watch. Mm -hmm. The supply ship, they have like actually prostitutes on the ship. But 
And so all the crew members on the U-boat were actually on the, the, the supply ship, the Black Watch, when the, the English bomb plane came and bombed the hell out of Black Watch. Mm. Right direct hit with bombs. Yeah. So, but some of the, maybe two or three of the crewmen on the U-boat managed to get back to the U-boat and not pull the plug more or less. So yeah. They actually sank it themselves. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it, it wasn't hit by anything, but it was sunk on purpose mm. by the Germans. The interesting thing was when we were diving here, mm. one old woman and a man, they were out fishing and uh, she was 16 years old when she witnessed the whole scenario of the sinking of the Black Watch and, and the Germans sinking their own uh, U-boat and, and uh, wounded soldiers getting washed up on shore and uh, she was trying to save of course the ones that she could save. So she was an old woman now and, and it was she was out fishing cod and, and they, they They came up to us. the dive boat yeah. and like, oh, are you diving the U-boat? <laughs> and they know exactly where yeah. the U-boat was. So they wanted really, they were really eager to, to watch the film, the, the shots from the U-boat, and she went like all quiet. Yeah, and if, was crying, if we would have had two cameras, because now we, we lent her the camera to watch the film from the U-boat, but if we would have had an extra camera, it would have been great to film her when she was watching the underwater footage from the U-boat, mm. because you she could was so see, touched, yeah. emotionally touched by that. So we are back in Helsinki, capital of Finland, and Kimo's old hometown. The research would continue from here. We'll have meetings with the Finnish Maritime Museum and other experts. These views are from a small island and local recreational park. And there's also the reminder that the Baltic Sea is an important commercial link between all these countries and beyond. Helsinki is also a working harbour. The low-lying winter sun is starting to feel warmer. The ice is melting, and soon finding a research boat will be a whole lot easier. You can see the Helsinki town skyline from here, dominated by Lutheran churches and an impressive Russian Orthodox cathedral. It was built in the 19th century, when Finland was ruled by the Russian Tsars. The Swedish divers are doing well in Narvik. Next they are diving the German U-boat supply ship, Black Watch. This is actually my, my own premiere of video photography, photography. Yeah, because I was borrowing Tour's camera. He was kind of tired with like, dragging me around. So I filmed this wreck, the Black Watch. And that was the supply ship we were talking about mm. just before. The German supply ship that was actually bombed to bits. Mm. Uh, it's pretty broken up, but it's, it's really shallow. It's like from 20 meters down to 45. So you have a quite a quite a good quite good uh, surface. You can see uh, pirates being line. floating on the different valves and. No, stuff. I'm actually filming the 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 cannon. Oh yeah.
Here we have the divers penetrate. Uh, Some of the superstructure yeah. direct or swimming one of the windows. It's, good, it's kind of cool, if I can say it myself, it's one of the best penetration <laughs> shots we took inside this wreck. Yeah. Diving inside wrecks is a dangerous business and similar to cave diving. All the divers in this team are also experienced cave divers. It was a great dive. Yeah, yeah. Americans are actually walk and practicing some uh, dive skills on top <laughs> of the wreck. I hope that's still on the series. <laughs> that's kind of fun. The Finnish Maritime Museum is situated at an imposing location on a small island outside Helsinki called, very fittingly, Wreck Island. It's a familiar sight to every ship's captain and boatsman in these waters, a landmark by the Helsinki seaside. You get a good view of Helsinki, the Helsinki archipelago and the famous Finnish icebreakers from here. We met maritime archaeologist Stefan Vesman. He told us about the Finnish waters. We actually have a lot of known wrecks in Finnish waters. For the moment, we have in our register 1,400 uh, sites underwater. There are other things than wrecks in, in, uh, in that archive. There are some planes and uh, some cars and, <laughs> and other things. Of, of these 1,400 objects, roughly 800 is uh, ancient monuments, old wrecks that are more than 100 year old. For example, in almost all other waters, you have a small uh, mollusk uh, called shipworm that, that is eating and penetrating wood. And, and they can uh, eat a quite large wooden ship in just 20 years or something like that. Then there are some other things that are special in, in the Baltic Sea. For example, these are solid rocks. So when you hit them, you definitely will get a bad leak. And just beside these rocks, you can have up to 40 meters of water. So, so first you hit a rock and get a leak, and then you go down and you go deep. The most destructive uh, phenomenon we, we have here is actually ice. But the ice doesn't go that deep. Uh, in, in, in worst case scenarios, you can have ice, pack ice going down to 20 meters, but, uh, but under that, the wrecks are pretty safe. In Finnish waters, the, the oldest wrecks that we for the moment know about is from the 13th century. We have actually some older uh, parts of, of, of boats in the Finnish lakes. Uh, they have been dated to the Viking Age. And then there are a, a couple of log boats that they are classified a little bit different. They have been dated uh, all the way back to the Stone Age. Uh, there, there is actually one find of a, of a Stone, Stone Age uh, log boat in the center of Helsinki from Alexis Kivenkatu. Stefan seemed to get especially excited about the prehistoric wrecks. A wreck doesn't get any older than this. The Stone Age log canoe was found by a building team at the centre of Helsinki. The rising landmass in the Helsinki Peninsula has covered the site of an earlier sea bottom. And 
there will always be new opportunity and, and constantly we are finding new wrecks also in our waters here. So, so there is enough job for, for many people here and I hope it will continue. Uh, it's always going to be difficult to, to decide and pick the, the wreck that you are going to excavate because every, every part of the history is special in its own way. And, um, and every wreck has its own history, which makes it very interesting. Well, as an archaeologist, uh, I am uh, specialized in, uh, in prehistoric things. And uh, maybe that is also where, where my own interest is at, at, at most. I would uh, love to excavate something from the Iron Age, for example, in the future. But you never know. We'll meet the Finnish maritime archaeologist Stefan Westman later in the series when we'll discuss other topics. The final footage from Narvik, Norway, Landego. This is the wreck from actually a Norwegian cable boat yeah. called Landego. You have this group of islands called Lofoten. Yeah. And this is like on the way up to Lofoten, mm -hmm. you can say. Yeah. It's one of the forts or whatever. And the visibility is awesome. People on shore try to... Um, they try to signal the boat. Yeah, try to signal them to stop because they were heading right into a mine uh, field. But they didn't understand, they just waved back to the people on shore and then uh, hit the, the mine. Mm. We don't know a lot about this wreck, but this film footage is stunning. The water is crystal clear and the wreck is covered in marine life. As a wreck, it's a beauty. The diving conditions in Narvik differ a lot from the Baltic Sea. you can actually find like wooden wrecks that are several hundred years old, mm -hmm. still totally intact. But wood in other seas, like in Norway or of course in other, any other place in the world, it gets eaten, eaten up and, yeah. by this kind of, it's like a war. war. Yeah, exactly. Like it isn't actually a worm, it's, it's like a muscle. Oh yeah, no, it's a, a snail clam. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, it's like kind of animal eating, <laughs> you know, wood in the water. <laughs> There's some kind of lanterns, like a storage plate mm -hmm. for lanterns you can see here. And the, the bow of the ship is actually blown off. When they hit the mine, the, the whole bow like, broke from the ship and sank in a couple of meters away from the rest of the ship, so it's actually fast. Oh, here you can actually see the steering wheel. The steering wheel. It's uh, almost nothing left of it because it's wood and so it's been eaten up by these creatures that we don't know the name of. <laughs> we don't know we even know what it, what they are. Yeah. This is a beautiful oh, shot from, the, oh, these from the back so of the ship. Yeah. The tour is actually like 15, 20 meters, up, uh, 20 meters outside of the right Yeah, and he's even the higher uh, closer to the surface mm. than we are. Now it's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's like cool, really cool uh, silhouette shots. Yeah.
It is finally summertime in Helsinki. Here you can briefly see the Finnish submarine Vesikko. It was built in 1933 and like Lembid in Estonia, is now a museum boat. The beautiful Finnish bastion, or in Swedish Sveaborg, was built in the 18th century during the Swedish rule to protect Helsinki from the Russians. During the Crimean War, it was bombed by the Brits. Contrary to its military past, it's nowadays colonized by artists and is appreciated by thousands of visitors every summer. Our search for a research ship continues. One of the strong candidates is privately owned Ronya. It seems sturdy and spacious. But then we saw Pelagonia and suddenly felt that this is it. It's an old 1930s workboat from the Finnish archipelago that's been in leisure use for a long time. At some point it fell into a state of disrepair and is now being lovingly restored by its current owners. It looks a mess. How will all this be finished in time for our diving trip in a couple of months' time? The owners assure us that it's going to be fine and are happy to rent it to us for the whole month of August. It's not the easiest launch boat for the divers, but it has enough space for all the gear and it has charm. There's still a lot of work to be done. But at least we're not renting that boat. So, that's it, really. We've done the research, found out about the Baltic Sea, the wrecks and the seaside locations. We have professional diving team and a boat. We pack our bags, cameras and tripods. And our Baltic adventure begins. The whole summer will be spent traveling the countries surrounding the Baltic Sea, visiting locations, meeting experts and diving. And filming everything that happens on the way. We had no idea what a summer we had ahead. The voyage starts from Harwich, under good omens of fine weather. The smooth seas take us to Cuxhaven, Germany. Our friend Yari flies to nearby Bremen and we drive to pick him up. Our first destination, the U-boat archive near Cuxhaven. The local naval historians are able to tell us more about the fate of the lost U-boat U-479. British German historian and author Jak P. Malman Schauel welcomes us at the door 
He has written over 40 books about U-boats. Baltic Sea Adventure. <laughs>